right? I'm here with Phil Barriano, uh, who was an activist in the gay community from the late 1960s, is that right? No, I moved here in 1976, 75, 75. Okay, uh, from 1975 to the present to the day. Present day. <laughs> um, so Phil, why don't you go ahead and start by telling me a bit about your background, where you grew up? Sure. Um, I grew up in New York City and um, in a Jewish family uh, and uh, went to school at uh, Cornell and then Columbia Law. Uh, I um, didn't come out until I was in middle age. Um, interestingly enough, one of the areas that I've done work over the years has to do with issues of uh, biological determinism, genetic determinism. I do a lot of work around uh, public policy dealing with genetics issues. So I've written extensively on um, whether or not uh, being gay is genetic, and uh, I haven't uh, looked at the literature or the uh, uh, work in the past 10 years or so, but certainly at a time when there were a number of prominent gay people uh, who were researchers who were publishing things saying that it was genetic, it turned out that um, uh, their research was not really very strong, and uh, so I did critiques of it. And I don't believe that while there are some people who say since they were four years old they knew that they, they were gay, there certainly are plenty of people like me who um, were married in a heterosexual relationship, who have kids, and so forth. and. Um, so my own trajectory was of that type and also reinforced the fact, unless my genes had changed someplace around middle age, that um, uh, being queer is not necessarily genetic. It has a biological component, of course, because just like uh, whether you like broccoli or not probably has some biological component in addition to cultural, but uh, I think that this notion of determinism was really pushed by a lot of people at a time in the uh, 1980s, 1990s, when they wanted to be able to say, I'm not responsible for being queer. Uh, and that's an okay position, but it's not scientifically based, I don't think. So my, yeah, my trajectory was, uh, I even went through, I guess, a bisexual period uh, uh, in my transition and came out uh, in my, I guess I would have been in my 40s, yeah. Okay. I was, I was at, um, teaching at Cornell uh, when my uh, marriage ended and I began coming out, although the two things are not related, they occurred pretty much at the similar time frame. And um, I lost my job at Cornell on the faculty because of my politics. They decided not to do a tenure review on me and because I was not in the regular cycle, um, it wasn't that they had to do it, where the, uh, which is the norm. Um, so I would have had a terminal year, as it's affectionately known, but I was able to get a job here at the University of Washington. So I moved to Seattle in 75, and uh, at that time I basically said, for political reasons as well as, as personal ones, that I should define myself as gay. Although for the next year or so, I also had some uh, relationships with women at the same time. Um, yeah, and Seattle, Ithaca, where I was at Cornell, was of course a very small town. Seattle, even in those sleepy old days, pre-Microsoft days and so forth, um, had much more going on and of course, it increased and uh, developed uh, in complexity and size enormously um, in the 1980s and so forth. Okay, and how did you first start getting involved uh, in gay activism in Seattle? Okay, I, I have an activist nature. I've been involved before I even came out here and came out as gay in um, uh, a lot of civic activities and social movements. Um, I think that it stems from uh, education and example from my parents. 
Um, for, for instance, when I was a kid, my father used to read me stories from a little kitty Bible, and I remember when we were talking about the prophets, the stories of the, uh, the prophets standing up before the king and saying what the king was doing was wrong. And out of that, I took a lesson that it's uh, the correct thing to do, the right behavior is if you think something is wrong, something that the government is doing or a corporation or someone strong and powerful, it's still okay and the right thing to do is to stand up and criticize it. Um, of course, at that uh, time there was the uh, Vietnam anti-war movements, there was uh, elements of the civil rights movements that I had been involved in, in many things. So when I came to Seattle and was defining myself as gay, um, getting involved in some of the gay rights activities that were going on seemed totally natural to me. Okay, and which organizations did you first get involved in? At that time, there was a, a gay community center located someplace around uh, where Temple de Hirsch is now. I don't remember the exact address, but sort of 16th south of Madison, that general area. And it was, uh, you know, one of these old Seattle houses. It's, I'm sure, long since been torn down. Um, and I went there to find out what was going on, and uh, the young guy that I spoke to was very nice and sizing me up in terms of age and being a professor at the UW and so forth. He said to me, you know there's a group that you should actually contact called the Dorian Group, um, and let me give you the contact information uh, for Charlie Bryden, who is one of the main figures in it. So I contacted Charlie, and um, I went to some of the things that he planned, and my response to what they were doing, the Dorians were doing, was actually very mixed. In one sense, I was really glad that there was a group, a gay identified group, gay and lesbian identified group, that was public and was participating in public debates and discussions that were going on. But their politics were more conservative than where I was at and where I was comfortable um, being and operating. So this contradiction that I felt vis-a-vis -vis the Dorians is illustrated to me, by example, uh, that when there were issues on the ballot for school bonds, Charlie and the Dorian group were always very prominently urging gays and lesbians to support it, even if we didn't have kids and talked about the fact that we have to assume certain responsibilities as members of our communities and so forth, which was a very, to me, positive, progressive, and uh, uh, exemplary kind of position. Uh, on the other hand, Charlie asked me if I'd be interested in, in being their lobbyist down in Olympia, and I realized that in many ways, um, doing that would compromise values or principles that I held in terms of positions they would be taking, which would be more uh, cautious and so forth than I would feel comfortable with. So I didn't stay very active with the Dorians, but I always supported their work. Now at that time, Seattle had passed uh, these two early ordinances in the late 70s on um, uh, non-discrimination in housing and in, um, what is it, what's the other one, was the other one in? Uh, employment, right, thank you, employment and housing. So um, there was um, very soon thereafter a reaction initiative to try to uh, repeal these things and um, like many other people who were here at the time and who had a political consciousness, I got involved in um, activities uh, to oppose. It was Initiative 13 as I recall was the, uh, was the thing. And there were actually three groups that were opposing, which illustrates the kind of political kind of uh, uh, divide, although we were unified in the sense of our goals and we didn't trash each other. There was uh, the, um, the group that was uh, uh, more mainstream, let's say, and uh, in that sense more, a little bit more conservative, and there were two more radical groups one of mixed gender and one uh, was called Women Against 13, as I recall. So um, at the same time, um, a prominent uh, gay guy who was employed by the ACLU, 
um, convinced me to get considered to be a member of the ACLU of Washington board. I had done work with the ACLU when I was back at Cornell. There was a chapter in upstate New York that uh, handled matters over several uh, counties. And on the uh, behalf of the ACLU, for example, I took one of the few times as a lawyer that I've ever actually argued in court, I took a case up through the New York State courts on behalf of someone at Attica arguing that um, he was deprived of his due process rights because he and his lawyer had not gotten access to the pre-sentencing report that was done on him um, before the actual sentencing. It was at the practice at that time to just spring these documents and things on the defendant and the defense attorneys. And very often, as in this case, they were full of errors and, and all. So I had an ACLU background. I got involved in the ACLU here in Seattle in the Washington State Affiliate. And of course, the ACLU of Washington was involved in promoting gay rights and uh, it actually took one of the country's very, very earliest uh, gay rights marriage cases uh, uh, long before it was a real public policy issue. Um, so that was the kind of early phases of my activism uh, for gay rights in Seattle. Okay. And uh, were you involved in the Seattle Committee Against 13? Was that the name of it? I yeah. don't remember. Okay. So I was not a major player in that. Um, I, I think I was more involved in the ACLU the support that the ACLU was giving um, uh, in that, uh, through that organizational framework. I, yeah, I, I didn't um, um, go like to a lot of the, co the community meetings directly that they were sponsoring. Okay. Um, I do remember the night uh, and the great uh, uh, joyfulness out on the streets when we defeated 13. Um, it was uh, the same election when uh, California defeated the so-called Briggs Amendment, barring homosexuals from schools. And these two victories were important because up until that point, there had, the right wing had won a lot of victories um, on the propaganda that Anita Bryant uh, and others were promoting about gays being child molesters and all the rest of the kind of stuff. And in fact, I believe Miami-Dade County had reversed its gay rights ordinance. So the fact that, um, uh, of course, uh, national reporting being what it is, the defeat of the Briggs Amendment was played up in a lot of newspapers and not what happened here in Seattle. But we knew how important the Seattle victory was. That was still a time when Seattle was a, um, um, a large, small town. Uh, and um, most people didn't, uh, in the U.S. and certainly abroad had no idea about Seattle, where it was, what it was, and everything. And that, of course, subsequently changed radically with the tremendous growth of Seattle in a number of very um, interesting ways. Um, uh, obviously, the, uh, the growth of things like Microsoft and the other IT hubs here um, became increasingly prominent in terms of uh, discourse in the US and around the world about the new technologies, the computer technologies. The explosion of Mount St. Helens, believe it or not, in 1980, when I traveled to Europe after that and I mentioned Seattle, people knew where it was. They said, oh, the volcano, whereas before then you'd have to say, yes, it's on the west coast, it's near Canada, but it's in the US. I mean, you'd have to go through these very elaborate uh, because Seattle was nowheresville um, as far as public consciousness. And uh, we all know how in the intervening decades uh, Seattle has really become a world city for a number of reasons uh, through many events, um, uh, including not the least, of course, the WTO situation here in 1999. Um, so what happens in Seattle now is um, uh, of greater significance elsewhere than it was certainly at the time of the defeat of 13. Okay. Um, how did you stay active after Initiative 13? I'm trying to remember and I don't have, um, um, I don't have lots of uh, clear ideas. I don't know if I mentioned, if we discussed this at all when we were together at the museum. Um, it's sort of, uh, active in gay rights things. 
Well, okay, so through the ACLU, uh, which of course was developing a national gay rights project, and then after a few years on the state board, I became the state's representative to the national ACLU board. So a lot of my gay rights focus and activities were through that lens of supporting um, uh, the movement in, as a member of the board, not a staff member, of course, but as a member of the board um, in different parts of the country. And then, of course, uh, was the, uh, the periods of AIDS, HIV and AIDS. And um, this was something that uh, would have appealed to me intellectually, if I can put it that way, on a no or emotionally on a number of grounds. Um, because um, people with HIV AIDS were of course being incredibly discriminated against and um, very horrific stories of people being beaten up and denied employment, being thrown out of their homes, all these kinds of things. So as a civil libertarian and as a gay man and an activist, all of these were appealing to me. Um, in addition, my lover at the time developed uh, AIDS and so I was thrust into the intensity of that situation very, very directly. Um, we had attended, Michael and I had attended the first organizing meeting here in Seattle for what became ACT UP Seattle, and a Seattle chapter of ACT UP. And it was at the Lutheran Church on 11th and two individuals um, um, sponsored bringing to Seattle um, two gay activists, one from New York and one from San Francisco, I believe, yeah, uh, who talked about the emerging AIDS activism in those, in those cities and including cultural as well as polit political kind of stuff, all the posters, all the zaps, the, 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 the um, cultural aspects of sit-ins and very political kinds of things. So, um, after Michael passed away, I went to, um, I actually took a sabbatic, um, a, a French colleague who was very close uh, got me an appointment in France and I spent uh, five months in Paris and I came back and ACT UP was just about to really get off the ground here and so I w got involved in it and it was through ACT UP largely and the ACLU working, um, I was very close to the ACLU of Washington's lobbyist and we would coordinate a lot of stuff in terms of lobbying, in terms of um, stuff dealing with Olympia and, and other sorts of things. Um, so it was the old story of like um, in, many, in many successful community politics stuff, there's an inside and an outside story. And that's to say you have to be able to work inside the system with legislators. We got the, the basic um, AIDS law passed here in Washington State, which was very progressive in a number of very important ways. And then there was the outside work where um, you're doing street demonstrations, you're doing much more rabble rousing. And it was rabble rousing and we were very conscious about it. Um, the period of ACT UP and the achievement of ACT UP was not only significant vis-a-vis -vis, uh, people with AIDS, as well as the gay and lesbian community,